All right, hey, I want you to go and grab your Bible and you can turn to 1 Peter is where we're going to be. We are so glad that you have joined us again. We're so grateful that you're here today. And uh, Travis noted the, the QR code there. Uh, as we go through the sermon, even, you can, uh, you can check that out. We've got great resources there to help you. Every week now, we have resources, questions that are going to help you. Uh, you, know, you can use as kind of a, a sermon response guide is what it is. You can use it in your devotional time in the week. Uh, some of our groups are, are recalibrating, targeting back to the sermon. And uh, our, our hope is... You know, it's not been, let's just get back into a room. Our hope is to make disciples wherever we are. And so uh, we want you to apply God's word throughout the week. That's why we're preaching, to apply his word, all right? So I want you to think with me here uh, this morning. I want to ask this question. What do you need more than anything else in the world? Now, that, that, that's a loaded question, I realize. I probably need some time to think about it. What do you need right now? more than anything in life. Now, I've had a little time to think about that this week. I would guess if you had, like me, had some time to think about that, what do you need, not want, need more than anything right now in your life? It just might be joy. We need a lot more joy in our world, right? And I think that joy is probably not a word that we would have used or have been using to describe the past six months. Not something that we've heard a lot about. Not a way that many would describe their lives or the world in our day. And yet, this is a calling card for us. This is a fruit of the Spirit that marks us as believers. And we're, we're to be joyful people, to be living this out in these crazy days. And so what I want us to do is we continue to apply the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God each week. Uh, check our website, social media. We're, we are memorizing Scripture every week. And the key umbrella passage or verse, a couple of verses here, is out of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I want to see if you can do this together. Let's all say it. Say it there at home as well. But the fruit of the Spirit, let's go, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, he says, this is freedom. This is how we're called to live. Now, last week, we talked about love, if you're with us. We said that love is the first and the greatest, right? All other fruit, if you will, our entire lives are driven by our love for God because he's first loved us. This is our verse that we memorized last week. We love because he first loves us. We said it was the Mount Everest of all the fruit. It's the, it's the greatest climb of the Christian life to love like Jesus. We said love like Jesus doesn't make sense. We, we said that it doesn't work. It's not pragmatic. We said it doesn't pay off. It's not a law of reciprocity. And we said love like Jesus never ends. And literally, Paul says that, that love never ends. And so today, we're going to shift our thinking, though, from love that's expressed, this grace that is expressed through joy. We're going to talk about joy, because what our world needs right now is a lot, a lot more love and a lot more joy. While many who claim to be or are Christians, even Christian leaders in our day, are mimicking the attitude of our culture. What we need to do, instead of, of following after, you know, supporting partisan politics or fueling anger online, the future belongs to churches, okay, and God's people who don't do that, that, that have a love for all people. What we need right now, friends, is an alternative, the culture needs an alternative to itself. The, the culture doesn't need us to, to, to just mimic or, or, or just live as culture is living. What the culture needs right now is an alternative to itself, and that's who we are. Now is the time, and now it, this is why we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Now is the time for us to stand up and to show that the answer to hate is not more hate. The answer to hate is love and a radical countercultural enemy love. It was embodied in Jesus, and now he calls us to live the same. We don't need to mimic the world right now, friends. 
And so in every, every um, domain of culture, every time you're, you're checking your news feed or watching what's happening, we need to provide an alternative. And the alternative is a life filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And so today we're going to talk about how we love like Jesus and and it's, it's through an overflowing love. It's through an overflowing joy. And we have chosen, you know, each week there's a, a fruit that we're saying, you can remember this. We want our kids to remember it. We're attaching uh, a fruit to a particular trait or quality of fruit of the spirit. Today, uh, orange. I thought there's nothing more joyful than an orange, right? And I could show you my mad skills of, of, um, of uh, juggling, but, but I won't do that right now. But what, what, what happens is when you cut open, uh, if I were to bust this open right now, which would really be amazing, um, what would happen? It would go everywhere, right? It, it is so juicy. It's so, right? And or, who doesn't love orange juice? It's like the nectar of the gods or something. But orange, oranges are, are so joyful. They splash all over the place like joy, right? It's like Jesus. It's like, like a full cup of joy. You're splashing Jesus all over people all around you. It's contagious. And, it, and it's really yummy, by the way. But uh, an orange, I think, represents joy in a lot of different ways. It, it, it's, it's our premise here is that God uh, has, has called us to live uh, and to grow in his grace, All of these fruit, okay, of the spirit is a response to his grace. And so as we grow in grace, we start to live these these qualities out in our lives. It's it's the result of a transformed life. It's God in us expressed through joy. So here's the big question. How can we be joyful? Many of you are probably thinking, how can I live with more joy? Now, immediately, we talk about this at Christmas time a lot. Immediately, we think joy is, is the closest thing we know is happiness, right? happiness. And yet it's not, as you'll discover today, there's a joy that is not based on happenstance. The word happiness comes from the Latin word hap, which means chance. And so it's, it's all about what happens to us, right? Regarding our health, possessions, circumstances, our relationships. And this is how it is for you and I today. In contrast, joy doesn't depend, watch this, on what happens at all. As we'll discover, it does depend on something that's happened, but not what happens on a daily basis. So whatever you're going through, and I'm talking to some folks right now who I know in our church family who are walking through some of the hardest times in their lives. We have people who are not here today because they're ill. And some are are very sick and challenged in these days. And and so I want to encourage all of us here. See, in contrast to to joy, joy, Happiness depends on what happens. Joy does not. It's why Paul says, you might know this in Philippians 4, 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, this is an imperative command. I want you to think about this. Rejoice is a command. This is a strange command, isn't it? It's not like, hey, don't kill, some, don't kill anyone. Okay, I'll try not to kill anybody, right? Don't lie. Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to really work hard at not lying. He says, rejoice. And then here's the thing. Always, always rejoice. This is a command. And here's what I thought about this week. We don't confront one another on this one. Like we might other sins. Or when we don't obey scripture. You, you know, and there are some people, you might know people like me. You see them and you go, what are you mad about this week? I mean, just come on, Right? Or you run into somebody, what are you just really unhappy about today, okay? Because some people just, you're, and, and you know, maybe I should, we should do better. I mean, I, I know this is a little, a, little, a little difficult, but maybe we should confront one another on our joylessness as believers. And I know some of us think, well, but Jeff, no, no, no. You're the one always talking about grace and even recently extending grace to those who are struggling and walking through even mental health challenges. Not everybody's joyful and I'm not, I'm not joyful for a lot of reasons. I, I get that. Yes, we're to love everyone, but my point is this. Here's what we do. Well, Jeff, I'm not joyful today and here's why. I'm really going through a hard time, okay? I'm, if, you know, if, if you knew what I was going through, my coworkers made me crazy. How can I be joyful? My, my kids are in a really tough season right now. It's really hard for me to be joyful. We have all these reasons, right, as to why we're not joyful. 
And many of us are asking, how can I be joy? Even, even in loss or, or illness or even I've lost a loved one. Jeff, you're telling me be joyful. How can I be joyful in a time? How can I be joyful in a pandemic? How can I be joyful at a time like this? How can I be joyful always? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because God tells us how. We can be joyful always. The Bible says that there is one called the Holy Spirit. And he lives in us and he does this work in us. If you've received Christ, okay, only if you've received him, you receive the power of the Spirit in your life. He makes you more loving. He gives you joy, peace. He gives you patience you didn't have. Kindness and goodness and a faithfulness. He gives you self-control. He makes you gentle. He allows you to live differently. And he tells us how. I'm going to use several passages we could have gone to. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Okay, so turn in your Bible again. You're at 1 Peter 1. We're going to look at verses 3 through 6. Paul introduces himself essentially, and he's writing to the believers. He's writing to us. I'm not assuming everyone watching me right now is, is, is you know, a Christian, but you're here. We're so glad that you're, maybe you're a seeker. You're seeking to understand more of the way of Jesus. And we're so glad that you've joined us today. There's a distinction between joy and happiness, which had me thinking, do you have to be a Christian to really understand this? I think yes and no. I think it's possible if you're not a Christian, you're listening, you're thinking, well, there's a joy or sense of well-being that's not based on my circumstances. And I would just challenge you to say, what is the source of that joy? That's what makes all the difference here. I'm going to make the case that there is one source there's one source of joy that separates Christian joy from all else and, and from all other circumstantial happiness, all right? Now, to make my point, David Brooks, uh, in his book, The Road to Character, he writes about a joy that's distinct from happiness. Uh, Brooks challenges the, us to build these inner lives marked by humility and moral depth. Joy, he writes is a byproduct experienced by people who are aiming for something else. Now, this is, we've talked about this, the paradox of, of, um, the paradox of pleasure and, and, and of happiness. The paradox of hedonism is that, that happiness is not found in pursuing happiness. It, it's found in pursuing something else. So he, he runs with this kind of idea. It's what he calls moral joy. He says this. He, he says, there's a joy of, for those who have their values in deep harmony with their behavior. So it's like a life of integrity. That's really what that means. A life of integrity brings joy. Now, I love a lot of what David Brooks writes, but he's speaking like any good religious person here. He says this. It, 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 he calls it a quiet sense of gratitude and tranquility, which is a byproduct of successful moral struggle. Now, again... He, and he's, he's nominally Jewish. In his most recent book, he calls himself a wandering Jew and a really confused Christian, is what he says he is. He married a, a gal who is, is a believer, evidently. But consider moral joy up against Christian joy. What I want you to see today is that Christian joy is indeed very different from happiness, very different from moral joy. Because Christian joy, here it is, is rooted in our salvation. Christian joy is the result of one's salvation, and true joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so Christian joy says, I may be as unhappy as I've ever been in my life right now, but my joy is fixed on the fact, not circumstances, not circumstantial happiness, but, sub but objective truth that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for my sin. How about this in regard to moral joy? He lived the perfect life for me, perfectly moral, became my substitute. By faith, I received that. He died on the cross for my sin, my shame, all of my sin upon him. My past is forgiven. My future is redeemed. And now I find myself forgiven, forgotten sins by God. He's forgiven me because of Jesus. Uh, this is where joy comes from. All of life comes back to this truth and this fact, regardless of what you're going through. So, Jeff, that's hard to remember. Yes. That's why we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today. <laughs> it's why you've got to get back to this truth all the time. Uh, Pastor Alistair Begg points out that joy begins in a, a surprising place. 
And I thought I'd go here as well. An unexpected place. Joy begins with guilt. We don't like to talk about guilt. We don't like to talk about guilt. We don't use words like misery to describe our sinful state, but that's exactly what it is. Misery in trying to find joy in circumstantial things. Even at your best, you're happy for a moment, then bam, it's taken away. If you live long enough, you know this is true. The things that once brought you happiness, you pursued all your life to get, and then they're gone. This is misery to live like that. And so there is a joy that comes from knowing that we've been saved. It's rooted in our salvation. So here's, how, here's the progression. Guilt moves us to grace. Grace leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to joy. So let's start the journey to joy in a most unexpected place. Let's begin with guilt. Again, we don't like to talk about guilt, yet we all wrestle with it. Why? Because we're guilty. That's why. Every single one of us. But there's a mercy that has come to us. Mercy, of course, is, is, is not getting what you deserve. You know, Megan early mentioned this mercy that we have being together. We don't deserve this, and yet we have it. Look at what he says here in verse Peter. Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now look at this. Why this great mercy? Because we have a problem. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody say all. Okay? All. All of us have sinned. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. We need a mercy, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, the, the, this sin is true of all of us. It's universal and it's terminal. And so for us to consider a moral joy apart from the transformation of God in our lives, there's, there's just no way. If we just keep pursuing moral joy, it just over time makes us more miserable. This is, see, there's a misery in being lost and not knowing you're lost because you continue to pursue these things. Maybe this marks your life. Notice that God caused this to happen. You see what he said? God caused it. And it's a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says nothing about working harder or getting better. He says God has caused this thing. He says nothing about our moral joy, if you will. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled. Look at these words. Unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is where, you know, theologians talk about living in the middle between the, the, the already and the not yet. We are saved, but we're going to be completely saved, realized salvation to come. And so guilt then leads to grace. All right. Grace. Look at what he said. This salvation, which is sheer grace. This, this new position we have, you may have heard the acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. I love that. Joy comes as we constantly get back to the solid rock of our salvation. So Christian joy, like all the other fruit, is manufactured in us. I mean, think about this, gang. We need an outside source to work in us. You, you take a seed out of the orange and you set it aside and it dies. How about a dry, oh, dried up seed dies? Put it in the ground. And outside sources start to work on that seed. It comes to life. His love awakens us. And then he does the work in us. See, the whole point is this. There's nothing in us that can create this kind of fruit. By faith, we receive his grace and his spirit comes into our lives. We were dead now. We have been brought to life. We need an outside force. This is the failure of, the, of, again, moral behavior kind of salvation or joy. It doesn't work. We need a substitute. 
We need someone who can come from the outside. His righteousness now has made us righteous. Look at verse six. In this you rejoice. This, okay, this gospel, what I just said, all that Jesus has done for us. Though now for a little while, okay, wait, he's saying, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. The language here, if necessary, say you will. And there's a purpose behind it all. Look at this. We rejoice which is to experience intense joy. The word rejoice, rejoice, uh, the re, the R-E is intensive. It's like a superlative. Rejoice, like joy upon joy, biggie size joy. It's joy, greater joy and more joy. This joy we experience has its source in God, right? It's like giving thanks. Think about that. I'm always thinking about this at Thanksgiving. Families gather around to thank, and like atheists, who, who are they thanking at Thanksgiving? Joy is the same way. Joy is an expression of gratitude to God for what he's done for us. All the fruit is a response to his grace. So we thank God. See, at Thanksgiving, we know who to thank. And in the same way, our joy is an expression. That's why we say we rejoice in the Lord. Our joy is in the Lord because guilt leads us to grace. Grace leads to gratitude. Gratitude for the grace that we've received in him. That he has removed our guilt. But wait, we rejoice even in our grief and various trials. Friends, I've walked with so many people in this season who have gone through so much grief. I mean, if I started to articulate or share stories, I thought about telling some stories, I would probably start crying right here. Of people who've walked through such tremendous grief, grief in this time, and yet, maybe tears of joy, who said, you know what, Jeff, though? Though I've lost my spouse. My dad died of COVID. I've lost my job. I've been through the worst season of my life. And yet God is still faithful. I still believe. I'm still grateful for the gratitude, all the gratitude of my heart because of what he's done for me. And friends, for those of us who've walked through seasons of difficulty, even now there's purpose in this suffering. The joy in the midst of the struggle has purpose. Look at what he says. Look at verse 7. So that... All right, this in the Greek it's called a henna clause. Here's the purpose. The testing, tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise. And look at the words glory, honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This grace is received. Look at what he says by faith. And it is through difficult times that our testing proves our faith. Not only proves our faith, our faith is revealed and others see us giving praise and honor, glory to God, even through the most challenging seasons of our life. Our faith results in praise and glory and honor when we see Jesus. And look, he says, even now, look at verse eight, though you have seen him, note the progression, you love him. I mean, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. Now, then, listen, that's a perlative language. You rejoice with joy, with great joy and more joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So guilt leads to grace, should. Grace leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to, here it is, joy. So you see the, the formula there. Guilt plus grace plus gratitude. Equals joy. Joy is rooted in the gospel. There's a time in, in Luke 10 where you might remember the disciples come back after a mission being sent out by Jesus, come back, and they're blown away. They're going, even demons are, are like, like, like obeying us in your name. Like they've never seen this before. And the power they have in the name of Jesus. And then you know what Jesus says? You remember this? He says, meh. That, and that's my translation, but it's like a remix translation. Meh. No, rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Isn't that it? Even in their highest moments of life, Christian joy is based on that. Let me ask you, when is the last time you rejoiced in the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? When's the last time you did that? And yet that is the source of our constant joy. And now Peter, look at what he says in verse 8. He said, he said, you believe in him. 
You see that? You believe in him. This is the Christian life, friends. Do you believe? Do you believe? Say, Jeff, why believe? It's so hard. I wish it was. Yeah, you wish you could be in the driver's seat is what you wish. You wish you could bring something to the table. And yet we can't. So here's what I want to ask you. What is the source of your joy? What is the only comfort in your life? Now, happiness comes from, from pleasant circumstances. Joy does not. You can rejoice always. Now, I want you to hear this. I want you to listen to this. This is from the Heidelberg Catechism. And it's a series of questions. There are 29 questions, in fact, written back in the mid-1500s by reformers after the Reformation for believers to answer questions so they could understand more deeply their, their faith, you know, in Christ, what's happened, and how to live in that. Okay, so as Baptists here, let's don't write off the catechism too quickly. I want you to just listen, okay? Listen in, and, and, and here's the first question of 129, the first one. What is your only comfort in life and death? Here's the answer. That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the powers of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, long answer, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Now, here's the second question. What must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? The answer, three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. And thirdly, how I am to thank God for such a deliverance. That's legit. I'm not saying we need to take on the catechism, but that is how we should respond. Where does this comfort in life and death come from? How can we live in it? The joy of our salvation is Jesus Christ and him alone, our salvation in him. And so as we close, I want to bring three barriers to joy. Three barriers. The first one, sinful foolishness. Turning to other things in pursuit of worldly happiness C.S. Lewis' famous quote comes to mind for me. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. When infinite joy is offered us and we don't even want it, Friend, what, where are you running to? What foolishness is standing in your way of joy? Confess that to the Lord today. Repent to others. He is our joy. The second thing that stands as a barrier is spiritual amnesia. It's forgetting the gospel. It's a biblical amnesia. And listen to me. Don't tell me God is silent if your Bible is closed. And we're wondering why we enter into such anxiety and such worry. Why communion today? Why the Lord's Supper? Because we forget. We need to come back. We, our sins are forgiven and forgotten. Again, I love Alistair Begg says this. We deplete our joy by forgetting what we should remember and by remembering what we should forget. Think on that one for a while. The last one, temporary happiness. The greatest barrier to true joy for many of us in the context of North Dallas is our happiness. Based on not, not God things, but good things, often really good things. We need to attach our joy in real time with the struggles that we face. And many of you might, like me, you say, Jeff, I, I get it, I understand it, but I have a hard time being joyful in the midst of it. Afterwards, I can, I, I can experience joy. I can do that. I look back and see. I can say, yes, how do I, how do, I do it in real time? Or I can't do that. What does that mean? It means that you're a growing Christian, is what that means. And praise God, 
that we're not saved by joy, our joy. We're saved by faith in his grace that's come to us. And listen, if you want to make Satan crazy this week, you want to come after the evil one, be joyful. Martin Luther, when someone would come to him with some sorrow or struggle, he would say, come, let us sing and spite the devil. Let's go. That's what worship does. Worship is militant that says, I will rejoice. Again, I'm going to say it. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. Nothing can take away my joy. Because in first, uh, no, in John 15, verse 11, here it is. This is our memory verse for the week. These things, this is Jesus, I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. What has he spoken to us? That you can receive this grace. We can live and abide in him is the context. And as we do, we live in him. Whatever comes our way, he's enough. Let me ask you, where will your mind be right now? What will you focus upon? How about this week? Where will your, what will your mind focus on? Your troubles? Your struggles, your trials, you say, well, it's hard not to. Turn your mind to the gospel, set your heart on him, center your thoughts on him, not your problem. We rejoice in our salvation because Jesus had dealt a death blow to our sin, to our past, and it secured our future. Listen, friends, today, confess your guilt. Receive his grace, express your gratitude, and live with joy.